Hello friends, my name is Lucas Mann. I'm the, the pastor of the Spring Church. We're actually just down the road, literally maybe just a few blocks down the street over here at the Spring Church. And uh, and friends, we uh, we come out here this afternoon out of, a, out of a sincere desire to see you made right with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. We, uh, we care for your souls. We care for where you're going to go when you die. We want you to be reconciled to God. We want you to be friends with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. We want you to have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says that we can have peace with God. See, friends, right now you're either at peace with God or you're an enemy of God. You're either friends or enemies with God. You, you have one of two relationships with God. And friends, we want you to enter into a relationship of peace. We want you to be adopted into the family of God. And Jesus Christ came in the world uh, to shed His blood for, for His people's salvation, to purchase redemption. And friends, it is that Lord, it is the Lord Jesus Christ that we are here this afternoon to exalt. It is His Gospel that we are here to preach, the Gospel of salvation. We're also here to warn you. We're here to warn you that if you reject Christ, you continue to reject the Gospel of grace and you turn your heart away from God and you, you continue in your sin, that that will bring you eternal damnation for your sins. But we want you to know that there is a Savior for sin. He saves from both the power and the effect of sin in the lives of His people, in the lives of those who come to Him in saving faith. And the text of Scripture I would like to look at briefly this afternoon is, is in Romans chapter 2 and verse 6. And the Apostle Paul writes very, very simply, very succinctly, he writes these words. He says, "...who will render to each person according to his deeds." And we know that he is talking about God because he actually says in verse 5, in the previous verse, the last word that is used there is God. It is God who will render to each person according to his deeds or her deeds. And that is what I want to consider this afternoon is God's justice, God's judgment that will come upon all people. That God will render each man according to what he has done. That God will see fit to administer justice in all the earth. See, God in His character is perfect, and He must punish the lawbreaker. And so God will see to it that He will single out the lawbreaker. He will single out the rebellious. He will single out the one who commits iniquity. And He will see to it that they are punished, that He renders unto them according to their deeds. Notice it says, who will render? Now that is God. This is God's action. You know, a lot of people say, well, only God can judge me. They'll say that a lot of times if someone is trying to call them out for their sin. And that is true. But that is not something to rejoice in, but something to fear. See, God is to be feared and to be reverenced. Because as Deuteronomy 4.24 says, The Lord our God is a consuming fire. That is, that He is so perfect in His holiness and in His jealousy for justice to be administered that He will bring upon the wicked punishment for their sin. And so God is the one who administers punishment to the wicked. And then it says, to each person, God's judgment will come upon each person. No one will escape it. All of us undergo. In fact, we if you reject Christ, you have already been judged. It's a past tense event. And then in another sense, it is yet to come. The judgment has already fallen upon you, for you have rejected, rejected the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Hello. And then at the last part of verse 26, it says, To each man, or to each person, I should say, according to his deeds. According to his deeds. See, we know, all of us know that we have sinned against God. We have an intrinsic knowledge of right and wrong. We have what is called a conscience. God has given us inherent knowledge of who He is and of what is right and what is not right, what is proper and what is improper, what is holy and pure and what is filthy 
and imprudent. And yet we act against that general knowledge of God's holiness and we bring upon ourselves condemnation, guilt for our sin. No one is exempt from this. That's why the text reads, each person. No one is exempt from this, no matter how much money they may attain. No, no, no matter what place in society they find themselves to have. No matter what the color of their skin is. No matter whether they are male or female. Whether they are young or whether they are old. The text simply reads, who will render to each person according to his deeds. But as we know from the, from the Scriptures, we know that the one who believes upon the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who trusts in the atoning work of the Lamb of God, he will not undergo judgment. He will not undergo judgment from God because the judgment has already been passed upon Christ on His behalf. The one who flees to Christ is freed from judgment and is freed from eternal wrath. They are freed from taking upon themselves the wrath of God against their sin. And so that's what I want to consider in this sermon is God's judgment, God's rendering to each person according to His or her deeds in accordance to His perfect character. And then after that, I would like to consider ultimately the gospel of grace which rescues us from this ultimate judgment of God. The unleashing of God's wrath upon the wicked. Christ frees us from that fear. He breaks the bonds of slavery to sin and gives the believer life eternal in Himself. And so that's what I want us to consider in this sermon. But I first want to also consider the context of this verse here in Romans 2. In Romans 2, what Paul is doing here is he is pointing out the error of those who are religious. He is pointing out the error of the religious thinking themselves to be saved by their performance and their righteous deeds. Thinking that they can placate God by their obedience to His commands. But he shows them that they are just as bad as sinners as anyone else and they are in need of salvation. He actually began in Romans 1 by saying in verse 16, he said, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation. That's what he was going to spend the rest of the book unpacking. But he first begins by explaining the bad news, the, 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 the plight of man, the, the helpless state of mankind, that he has sinned against God and he deserves punishment for his sin against God. And he has offended God and he deserves hell for it. And when someone comes to grasp that, and then in light of that, they understand what Christ has done for them, then they grasp the glory of the Gospel. They see how glorious it is that Christ came to save His people from their sins. They see how great it is that the, why He had to come and, and satisfy the wrath of God. When they grasp that, when they see their helplessness and their hopelessness, So in order to understand the good news of Christ's salvation, Christ's salvific work, one must grasp the hopelessness of their lost state. And so that's what he does in chapter 1. And then as I said in chapter 2, he points the finger, he puts the focus, he turns the spotlight not onto the, uh, onto the pagan, which he has already done, but onto the religious, onto the religious people who think that they are okay and that they are gener generally good people. That's why in verse 2 he says, Therefore you have no excuse, every one of you who passes judgment. For in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. And we know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. That was verse 2 there. And then he goes on the next couple of verses and explains really the, the supposition of the righteous. That they suppose they're going to escape God's judgment through judging the wicked. But they will not. They will not. The only way that one person can escape God's judgment against sin is through the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ on their behalf. That's the only way someone can be saved is if they believe upon Christ alone for salvation. 
That's just the only way. And so that gives us a little background to verse 6. And even more background is, uh, is verse 5 when he says, But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, he's speaking again to the religious of his day, and specifically, this would have been the Jewish people who thought themselves to be right in the eyes of God, but surely were not, and they needed a, sal a Savior. They needed salvation. But when He came, they rejected Him, and they turned their hearts away from the Son of God, the exalted King of the universe, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he says, but because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. And so he calls them out in their hypocrisy and says, you're storing up God's wrath for yourself. And then that leads us to verse 6, which I want to consider God's judgment upon the deeds of of every person who is outside of Christ. So verse 6 reads, who will render to each person according to his deeds. And as I said a moment ago, who? That's referencing God. And then it says, will render. God is the one who judges the wicked. And that is of great fear for the ungodly because the ungodly cannot stand on the day of judgment. When Christ comes to judge the world in righteousness, it will not be a day of rejoicing for the wicked, but it will be a time of, of great fear and anxiety for those who reject the gospel of grace. That's why in the book of Revelation in chapter 19, verse 15, it says this concerning Christ when He returns. It says, From His mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it He may strike down the nations, and He will rule them with a rod of iron. And He treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. Friends, Christ is coming to tread the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And He will render to each person according to what He has done, according to His deeds or her deeds. And that leads me to the next part. It says, who will render to each person. As I said earlier, no one is exempt from God's judgment upon the wicked. No one is exempt from this. It is something which is upon all unbelievers. All people who reject Christ are under this. All people by default are under this judgment of God. And they deserve God's punishment for their sin. And then it says, lastly, according to His deeds. His deeds. We have all done wicked deeds against our conscience, against what we know to be true and what we know to be right. We've done it anyways. We have offended God. And we bring upon ourselves guilt and condemnation for our sin. And so truly, whether religious or not, whether a church attendee or someone who is unchurched, all people are guilty of breaking God's law and deserve His wrath against sin. That's why in verse 9 it says, There will be tribulation and distress uh, for every soul of man who does evil to the Jew first and also to the Greek. There is no partiality with God, friends. He is not a respecter of persons. No. My friends, God is just in His punishment of the wicked. He is just in doing so. And as I said earlier, this text clearly speaks to this beloved and glorious attribute of God. That God in His very person, in His very being, the Father in His glory, is the judge of both the living and the dead. He is the one who renders judgment upon the wicked. And that is an outworking, that is a, a flows forth from His character and from who He is. It comes out of His attributes.
Also, another attribute that God manifests to us, and we see it all around us, is God's mercy. God's mercy. And connected to God's mercy is also God's patience. See, every day, my friends, you experience God, God's mercy. Because every day, He is holding back from you that which you deserve. He is holding back from me that which I deserve. And He is doing that out of the bounty of His character. Out of the wealth of who He is. And He is patient. He does that for a very long span of time. A very long period of time. That shows us something about God and who He is. Also in Psalm 121 verse 2 it says, the psalmist writes, My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. In verse 5, the Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. In verse 8, the Lord will guard your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forever. God is gracious toward His people. That again comes forth out of the character of God. Who God is. He in His essence is gracious. However, that never throws to, to the side His holiness and His justice. And dear friends, in God's holiness He has given us His law to obey. He has given us His holy commands to live in obedience and in submission to. But the problem with with that is not the law itself, but it is our failure to keep it. It is our breaching of the law that is our problem. For God has said, you shall not lie, you shall not steal, you shall honor your mother and your father. Those are just three of the Ten Commandments that God gave. And those show us the character of God, His perfection and His moral purity, but they also show us our sin. They show us our failure to live up to the character and the moral purity of God. They show us our breaching of His, perfect, of his perfect standard of righteousness. That's why Paul could write in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The glory of God here being uh, speaking to the fact of, of God's character and God's who He is, His weightiness. His glory, we fall short of that. And even uh, a few verses back in verse 20, he even says, For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. That's the purpose of God's law, friends. It's to show us our sin before God. Let me ask you, have you broken God's law? Have you lied? Have you stolen? Have you dishonored your mother and your father? Have you committed adultery? Have you fornicated? Do you enjoy pornography? Those things are sinful in the eyes of God. And they are in God's judgment. Those things offend God and they are, again, in contradiction to His moral perfection. Uh, in contradiction to His character. And so when you do that, it's an offense, it's an affront to God. And so all lawbreakers deserve divine punishment. That's why we just read there in, in chapter 2 when it says in verse 9 that there will be tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil of the Jew first and also of the Greek. See friends, God's judgment comes upon the wicked because they've broken His law. If someone here in Lawrence County were to break into a business here and they were to steal a great amount of money, perhaps even to injure someone in the process, they would be arrested for having broken the law, having stolen from someone else, and they would have to be thrown into prison. That would be the just penalty for their law breaking. And no, no one would contend that. No one would disagree with that because that's justice. How much more is God perfect in His justice? How much more holy and how much more absolutely, in the fullest sense, good is God than any other man? Mm, he is many times greater in His perfections than even the most holy and the most righteous saints on the earth.
And so we find ourselves in this position of having broken the law, having trampled God's law underfoot. We have sinned against God and because of our sin, we incur the punishment. We bring upon ourselves the just penalty for sin. And what is God's penalty for sin? Well, the Lord Jesus Christ described it in His ministry many times and it is a place called hell that is god's punishment for sin is hell is the place of weeping and gnashing of teeth the place of outer darkness jesus said it is a place that has an unquenchable flame you certainly my friends do not want to go there no one in their right mind wants to go there and friends I certainly do not want you to go there. I don't want you to die in your sins. I don't want you to perish for all eternity under the wrath of Almighty God. I desire that no man would perish and, and, and go to hell for his sin, but that he would believe upon Christ for eternal life. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew 25, 46, that the wicked will go away into eternal punishment. And so we find ourselves, even if we try to be religious, even if we try to put on a thin veneer of righteousness, it doesn't work. Trying to persuade God to forgive us doesn't work. Imagine that in a court of law, a murderer here in Lawrence County trying to convince a judge to let him off the hook because he tried, and did, tried to do something good, tried to give to charity, or tried to, to donate blood or tried to do community outreach or community service. It doesn't work, my friends. We cannot try and, and, and bribe God and try to obtain His forgiveness by our own religious performance. It doesn't work. How do we know this? Romans 3 tells us, verse 20, by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in His sight. That is why those who are religious are in great need of a Savior, are in great need of eternal life, because they, as well as the pagan, have breached God's law, and have broken it, and have trampled it underfoot, and their hearts are just as wicked and just as perverse. Jeremiah 17, 9 tells us that the heart is more deceitful than all else, and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? And so we are truly, in the fullest sense, we are without any hope. But as Galatians tells us, when the fullness of the times came, God sent forth His Son. You want to know what the Gospel is? Jesus Christ is the Gospel. Jesus Christ is the good news. Jesus saves from sin. He saves from the wrath which is to come. And friends, Christ came into the world and fulfilled the law that we broke. He fulfilled the law of God as Matthew 5 tells us. He lived in submission and in obedience to the will of the Father perfectly. And then after those years of, of ministering to His disciples and preaching and teaching and healing and doing miracles to validate what He was saying, to validate His claims to be the Son of the Most High God, to be Almighty God, He then went to the cross and He was stretched upon the cross as the Lamb of God. He was, he was punished at that cross as if He was a sinner. Do you see that? Do you see that the innocent was treated as if he was guilty? The, un the, the righteous as if he was unrighteous. He was nailed to that cross and he was made ridiculed. He was made a public mockery. Scripture describes it as his humiliation, that he was humiliated. And on that cross, the Father's wrath was poured out on His Son. The Father's wrath was unleashed upon His Son. 
Listen to what it says in Matthew 5, excuse me, I'm sorry, Romans chapter 5, verse 9. It reads, much more than having now be justified by His blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through Him. At the cross, the Lord Jesus Christ was treated as if He was a sinner, and therein and thereby was punished under the wrath of the Father. The Father treated Him as if He was a sinner, though He was sinless. And He satisfied the wrath of God. He said, it is finished. To tell us die, it is paid for, it's gone, it's, it's done. The guilt of God's people was, per was paid for. It was put away at the cross of Jesus Christ. That shows us the love of God. How much He loved His people. That God so loved the world that He would send His Son like that. And it also shows us God's holiness. That He never negates His holiness. He never, he never compromises His justice. And then after three days in the tomb, Jesus Christ rose from the grave. He rose from the grave by His own power. The, the grave, death could not hold Him. On that third day, that Sunday morning, some 2,000 years ago, the Son of God was raised up from the dead. And He is alive today. And He lives forevermore. He lives to make intercession for the people of God. He lives to do that. Right now, He is at the right hand of the Father in glory. He's in heaven. He is seated in heaven right now at the right hand of the Father. And here is the command in Scripture. You must repent and believe the Gospel. You must turn from your sin and turn to Christ. You must flee your pornography. Flee your drunkenness. Flee your selfishness. And trust in Jesus Christ. Believe the promises of God as they are revealed in Christ. And you will be saved from your sins. The Father, whoever comes to Christ in saving faith, will be forgiven of all their sin because of Christ's work at the cross. And they will be given the righteousness of Christ. They'll be wrapped in the righteousness, the eternally justifying righteousness of Christ. They will be counted as if they lived Jesus' life because Christ was counted as if He lived their life. That's the exchange. That's the greatest deal in the world, friends. That Jesus takes my sin. Jesus becomes responsible for my guilt. And I become responsible for His righteousness. And it's all as a gift of grace. Salvation is a free gift of God's grace. It is not by the works of the law. But by grace are we saved. Even in the very first book of the Bible, in Genesis 15, 6, we see an account of Abraham's faith, and it says simply, that he believed in the Lord, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. Abraham believed the promises of God, and God credited it to Abraham as righteousness. God gave him a gift, and it was gift righteousness, so that Abraham could stand before God, clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, and be eternally saved. And that offer is for all who will this very day. Whosoever will come, come and have eternal life in Jesus Christ. The offer of salvation goes forth this afternoon. It goes forth as the Word of God is preached. That you, sir, even you, can have life eternal in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why Isaiah 55, 1 says, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in abundance. God is stretching forth His hand this day and is bringing forth the offer of, of, the, the offer of grace and says, Whosoever will, come. And this is all to the end that God would be glorified. All for the glory of God. It's for His glory and His praise and His good pleasure. For the glory of Jesus Christ. This has all been ordered in this way. 
And so friends, I exhort you to flee to Christ this afternoon, to turn from your sin, you sinners, you pagans, to flee to the Lord Jesus Christ and be cleansed. And you religious, you certainly need a Savior. You certainly need salvation. I don't care whether you go to church or you've had an experience in a church or you've been affirmed by religious people that you're okay. You need eternal salvation. The Word of God says you need salvation. So flee to Christ this day. Look and live. And even for if any Christians are here this afternoon, I encourage you, my dear brethren, to, to rest in these realities, to rest in these truths today, and to evangelize the lost, to share this gospel with a lost and dying world for the glory of God and the glory of Jesus Christ. To preach this gospel to your family and friends through conversation. To spread this gospel, because it is the gospel of God's glorious, saving grace. Mm. And so we have seen here in Romans chapter 2, verse 6, that God will one day render to each person who is outside of Christ judgment for his sin or her sin. And the only way one can escape this punishment, the only way is through the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ at the cross. The only way. Yes, sir. Yes. Oh, I, yes, sir. Oh, I, I'd love... I, I'd lo take it, take it, take it. No, absolutely. Are you a believer? Absolutely. Are you a believer? Oh, okay. Okay, Do thank you, you sir. Thank you. Are you sure? I... I Okay then. And so friends, and so dear friends, that is what we have seen, that Christ saves. And as I said, this is all for the glory of God. This is all to God's glory. Everything in this, in this world, all creation, redounds to the glory of God. Everything is working to that end. And even the gospel of grace, the gospel of Jesus Christ, is to the glory of God. It is this gospel which brings God the glory. And so I exhort you to bring God glory by coming to Him through His Son, through Christ the Savior. I'll leave off with these words from 2 Peter 3, verse 18. It says, and Peter here speaking to believers, he writes, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Indeed, to Jesus Christ, the Almighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, the King of Glory, to Him be glory forever. Amen. 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 There's all the people. Brother, you want to say something for the live stream? Um, we're good. Just pray. Pray that God would the preaching to bear fruit mm, amen amen come join us come join us yes yes come and join us all you south i mean uh, all you lawrence folks come and join us please absolutely well that concludes this time god bless you all